One thing that the Kirby series always loves to do is put their best games out towards the end of a console's lifespan. They've been doing it practically since the franchise's inception. While it comes with the disadvantage of poor sales if there's a newer console already out, this Kirby staple ensures that those games have all the experience of developing on that console backing them. It definitely worked out in Kirby Dreamland 3's favor, and when it came to modern 2D Kirby, the last mainline entry on the 3DS would push the series to new heights. Hello everyone, this is the RPG Monger, and today let's dive into Kirby Planet Robobot. Ever since the Kirby series had gotten back into its stride with Return to Dreamland, Hal had created a pretty good foundation for future Kirby games. Make sure to maintain the classic copyability-centric gameplay, but also spice things up with a new gimmick every game. And while Return to Dreamland and Triple Deluxe are both great games, I feel Robobot took the best ideas from both of them to make one of the best Kirby games in the series. Though before I get to that, I'd be remiss not to immediately address the aspect that from the very beginning sets Robobot apart from every other Kirby game, its theming. Expanding on the mechanical setting and atmosphere established in previous Kirby locales, Hal would take those isolated segments and make a whole game out of it. Sure, the game still contains many Kirby hallmarks, like worlds based off of typical things like grasslands, the ocean, and a desert, but in Robobot, they're all presented through a mechanical lens. It's as if you're watching the steady eradication of Popstar's nature in real time, only making the urgency of Kirby's mission all the more real. Don't get me wrong, the cutesy fantasy theming that's synonymous with a lot of Kirby is perfectly fine. I'd go so far to say that it makes Kirby games what they are in certain circumstances, though a sudden change like this is exactly what the series needed. And out of everything, this isn't seen clearer than in Robobot's new gameplay gimmick. Following this new trend of creating gimmicks out of pre-existing Kirby mechanics like stronger abilities or a stronger inhale, the Robobot armor of Planet Robobot outshines its predecessors by a mile. At its core, it's not all that different from super abilities, considering the Robobot armor can take on various abilities to wreak havoc. It's the decision to make it less of a kill button and more of a direct extension of Kirby that I feel makes it much more fun. Plus, who doesn't like the idea of how just giving Kirby a mech. It's perfect. The fights where the Robobot armor actually gets utilized have to be some of the most memorable from the series. Despite it not being hard, that fight where you have to quickly unscrew the robot as missiles close in on you was next level intense. So being overpowered aside, I feel the decision to make the Robobot armor function like a stronger Kirby works better for puzzles as well, whether it be moving circuits around or sending your bombs off to solve things for you. And with its 13 abilities you gain access to throughout the entire game, the Robobot armor absolutely beats super abilities when when it comes to variety. As you progress through the game, it's always a joy finding out what more abilities they made for this gimmick, some of them like Wheel practically transforming the game altogether. When it comes to my personal favorite, I kind of want to say Mike purely due to the luxury of actually having Mike be a proper ability and not three one-off attacks. They're all great, though when it comes to normal copy abilities, Robobot would also create some new ones for Kirby as is tradition. This time the new abilities brought to the table would be Doctor, Poison, and ESP. Starting with Doctor, it's definitely the most ridiculous out of the three. For a lot of its attacks, it's pretty standard Kirby stuff with a focus on its pill projectiles. The main unique thing with Doctor is the ability to craft potions on the fly, there being a 1 in 4 chance of said potion dealing fire, ice, or electric damage with the chance for a healing potion of Kirby's heart. Then with poison, it's kind of a reskin of water with a few differences. The main difference, alongside a few diverging attacks, is that many poison attacks leave behind residue that'll damage the enemy over time. If anything, it's almost as if the water copy ability got polluted due to the mechanization of Popstar. Lastly, with ESP, Kirby Kirby finally beat Earthbound after all these years, this ability probably being my favorite out of the newcomers. For one, its ability that lets Kirby disappear and reappear while dashing is so much fun to spam. I didn't find myself using the controllable sphere of energy all that much admittedly, but the power to counter attacks with precision guarding gives ESP a good leg up on its peers. Too bad that like with every game, I suck at the timing. And while those are the only three newcomers, they're technically not the only new abilities per se, as Robobot brings back both Mirror and Jet from the Abyss. Receiving the return to Dreamland treatment of getting significantly modified, I cannot tell you how happy I was to see Mirror back. I'm sure plenty of you will agree that its split dash thing was always the best. So now on top of that, Mirror has even more cool attacks like its up B and down B moves that have Kirby suddenly multiplying. I must be too used to playing superstars, hearing Mirror attacks without the OG sound effects just doesn't feel right. Jet would also receive some notable changes, its new attack and improved hovering modernizing the classic ability. It's just much like with its original incarnation, it was never an ability 
I gravitated towards necessarily. Aside from those, Robobot's ability pool is a great mix of all the new, two of the new abilities Triple Deluxe created making a return. Don't worry, Beetle, you'll be back soon. Hell, this game would even see the return of the Smash Bros ability, only found in select areas if you don't have the right amiibo to get it. Though next to abilities, Robobot would also bring back equipable items again. For the most part, these are pretty much taken from Triple Deluxe, but the few they added were a nice addition to the game. Kind of functioning like Return to Dreamland's key, Robobot brings in the battery item that gets used in quite a few puzzles to usually get either a sticker or a collectible. However, in an entirely original idea, Robobot also added the remote controller. There aren't that many levels where it shows up, but when Kirby holds it, a robot in the background follows your movement. Then, usually in order to get a collectible or progress, you've got to navigate the robot around without it or yourself getting hurt. It's a pretty fun idea. And now that I've covered the core gameplay found in Robobot, I can't hold myself back any longer from gushing about its levels and plot. Like a surprising amount of Kirby games, Planet Robobot falls back on the classic Kirby trope of some unknown entity corrupting Popstar from above. Only instead of a one-eyed eldritch horror, this time it's capitalism. One and the same, really. What an opening cutscene, too. That part that has both DDD and Meta Knight defending Popstar was quite the way to set high stakes immediately. As from the get-go, the mechanized world of this game is a hostile one. Take the very first level, where while keeping in theme with most first levels being peaceful grasslands, it gets turned on its head as a mechanized wispy woods is out for blood. I really like the detail of it trying to attack Kirby through the tube, and now that's how you set the tone for a game. In the actual layouts of stages here, things aren't too different compared to Triple Deluxe. Since this is, after all, a 3DS Kirby, expect lots of going in between the background and foreground throughout the game. Not to mention, while minimal, a Robobot would retain some 3DS motion controls in specific sections. And of course, with Robobot comes a new bottomless pit of collectibles to get on your journey, in this case the Code Cubes. Much like Triple Deluxe's Sunstones, they mostly function as a way to unlock unlock both the world's boss and extra stage if you collect all of them, though there are a few bonus rewards if you get every one in the game. Then, far more importantly, there's the stickers. Replacing the relatively useless keychains in comparison, Robobot stickers actually have a nice cosmetic use in-game, other than being nice to look at in your gallery. Upon collecting a couple, you can actually use them as decals on Kirby's Robobot armor, which no matter what form it takes in the game will always display them proudly. Finally, a game where I can create the DDD mobile. They're without a doubt one of the best utilized collectibles in the Kirby series albeit sharing the same slightly annoying property of keychains where the game will be perfectly content with giving you every sticker but the ones you need to 100% the game. Going back to the levels in this game, I'd honestly say Robobot has the best first world in the series. Kirby 64's Pop Star will always hold a special place in my heart, but they throw so much at you here. On top of the ones I've talked about where you get chased and you get the Robobot armor, the other stages are good too, that one on the train being a nice unique change of pace. Then in the last one before the boss, there's the one type of stage that's seen in all but one of Robobot's worlds. Appearing to be a factory or lab in the shape of a screw, these levels are always a treat, especially for me as they all contain a different remix of a past Kirby song, which brings me to this game's soundtrack. I'll definitely talk about it more later, I guarantee you, but to just touch on it now, man is it so good in Robobot! Where Kirby music was great before, Robobot's theming makes it so much more memorable and better. Like how Egg Engines warped the soundtrack of Return to Dreamland, we see that here on a much larger scale, with practically every song having a more electronic sound to it and even a healthy dose of chiptune. Here in particular, the song they chose was Sand Canyon 3 from Kirby's Dreamland 3, a fitting choice considering it plays in the bizarre alien spaceship originally. About time too, as at this point, Dreamland 3 was very much in need of getting some modern remixes. I'll do my best to limit my gushing about the rest of the remixes until later. At the boss of the world now, Clanky Woods is definitely worth talking about, since much like many things in Robobod, it's absolutely the best incarnation of the iconic first boss of Kirby. For one, after getting Mother 3, Clanky Woods is extremely mobile, things mirroring his normal fight at first, until all of a sudden, things go full Kirby 64 with his second phase. Though why stop there? In Robobot, regular bosses will even get third phases, as Clanky Woods traps Kirby in a tight spot. He actually managed to damage me here, which is definitely something to be said when it comes to Wispy Woods fights. To think this was merely how the game started. Next in Resolution Road, we've hit probably one of my favorite set pieces of the game, with this part of Popstar getting urbanized into a little city. It's so nice seeing what creative ways HAL managed to merge its usual whimsical locations with a mechanical developed landscape. Like here in Resolution Road, the actual buildings that make up the city are shaped like little cute milk cartons and drinking cups. Or later on, when the Haltman Company is extracting oil from Popstar using massive blenders with spaghetti tied around forks serving us power lines. Clearly, a lot of time and effort went into making these unique background set pieces that honestly only make Robobot as a whole stand out that much more. And by far my favorite of these has to be in the water world, where the underwater cities are actually composed of glass bottles. Upon going back to those 
those stages for cubes, I realized the early stages in that world actually took place in a giant sink. But I digress. Going back to Resolution Road, Robobot bestows the jet mode for the Robobot armor here, once again bringing back some solid side-scrolling shoot-em-up gameplay into Kirby. And much like Triple Deluxe, Planet Robobot would continue the trend of creating special themed stages on top of the overarching one of the game, seen earlier in the train stage and now with the casino. Paired with the other one later on, these are such a joy to go through with the various casino-themed hazards you've got to overcome. I especially love that part where you've got to punch a pool ball in order to get the treasure chest in the background. Solid stuff, paired with a wonderful track. Then at the end of this world with its boss, the Hollow Defense API, we've hit the beginning of Robobot's plentiful bounty of fan service. In retrospect, it doesn't necessarily reach the point that Star Allies took things where practically half the game was comprised of it, though at the time, Robobot had by far the most references to past Kirby games. This fight for one is literally one big reference sandwich with a recreation of Kirby 64's second boss making holograms of past Kirby fights. Really neat way to incorporate one of the more mysterious fights in the series into the ever-growing mass of Kirby lore. It gave Ice Dragon a chance to trample me once more in the game's harder modes, so it's a win-win. In the ocean-centric world following that, a new gameplay-changing Robobot mode would see the expansion of the wheel ability. Now, alongside going fast, the Robobot armor can jump into the background or foreground at will, an ability that in my eyes is the peak of this mechanic in the 3DS Kirby games. However, it does come with the side effect of me getting way too overzealous and jumping to my doom. Stuff like this is why the Robobot armor will always be my favorite Kirby gimmick. And aside from that, the one ice themed level they snuck in always puts a big smile on my face when you've gotta make those ice cream snowmen. Then at the end of this world when Kirby meets Susie, the secretary to the boss of the Haltman Works Company, we learn that to fund their ongoing mechanization of Popstar, they're sponsored by Skillshare. Hey you, tired of wasting all your efforts trying to get back your lost daughter from whatever dimension she got sent to? Want to hone your skills in a timely fashion in order to use your ancient supercomputer to bring her back? Well, it's not too late, as Skillshare is a service for you. With Skillshare's wide variety of courses on practically anything you can think of, and now you can get the programming skills needed to properly utilize such an ancient device. Actual side note here, I've been really meaning to take a proper course in something like music theory in order to get better at how I analyze songs in my videos. I've picked up a few things here and there, but it's nowhere near where I want to be with it. So now that I have Skillshare from this sponsorship, I'm genuinely going to use it for those ends. In turn, if you need a good starting point for a passion you want to pursue, or improve your skills in anything, do use the link in the description for Skillshare. The first 1,000 people to use it will get a month-long free trial to take any courses you're interested in. That being said, let's see what the rest of Mechanized Popstar has to offer. In the last two Popstar worlds of Robobot, most of the gameplay mechanics found in the game have already been introduced at this point, so instead of bringing more, the game focuses more on expanding what's already been brought in. For instance, this world features the best Jet Robobot segment in the game, where they even brought back Kabula. That laser attack of hers does a really good job of messing with you as it goes from the background to the foreground. Later, with the ominous tech pyramids of this world, I honestly wasn't that surprised to hear the remix they slid into these stages. I mean, sure, don't get me wrong, I love this rendition of Factory Inspection from Kirby 64, but let's be honest with ourselves, did anyone really think they weren't going to bring this track back for Robobot? That and Sand Canyon 3 were some of the first times Kirby even experimented with mysterious technology-centric stages like this. Oh, and I guess technically the various themes of the Halberd fall into that category too, though trust me, they made it into Robobot and then some. Speaking of which, at the end of the fourth world, Meta Knight shows up. Or, well, kind of, as upon losing to Haltman's invasion, they outfitted Meta Knight with cybernetic enhancements to create Mecha Knight. You may not be thinking about about it a lot with all the cheery Kirby gameplay, but things like this definitely highlight how dark Robobot can get. More on that in a bit. With the exception of bestowing the mic mode for Kirby's Robobot armor, the fifth world is similar to the last one in that it mostly features expansions of previous level concepts. Now don't misunderstand me, that doesn't mean the entire world is a mere rehash, because all the things they bring back are considerably enhanced. I'd go so far to say that Rhythm Route is my favorite of Robobot's pop star worlds. The new casino and train are a fun time, but the new area made for the Robobot armor's wheel mode is where I feel things shine the most. I always loved areas that feature visuals in time to the music, though when it comes to music, the boss of Rhythm Route still has one of my favorite songs out of the whole series. Breaking the tradition of DDD getting possessed, the Haltman Works Company decided to just clone him instead, this fight appearing normal at first, only for DDD to split into three DDDs. Look at how determined they are to get Kirby. Too bad they get easily annihilated. In any other Kirby game, that'd be it. Pack it up, we've filled our DDD quota for the year. Except this isn't just any Kirby game, 
because once the elevator the fight takes place on reaches the top, the three Ds get into a specially designed cannon. In a vacuum, this fight isn't that much more challenging than its previous phases, as the cannon does become predictable after a bit, but of course, what made me adore this battle is the track backing it. I swear, this is the last time I'll gush about music until after I cover the next world, I just can't help myself. In the beginning, its groovy rendition of the DDD theme in 3-4 time is already good on its own. However, in the second half of the song, where the DDD theme transitions into My Friend and the Setting Sun from Kirby Superstar, I genuinely had to pause the fight so I could listen to it properly. Literally, this game could not have hit me in a weaker spot when it comes to nostalgia. I can't praise it enough. That orchestral swell near the transition pushes it far above merely being just another remix in my book. I'm sure you'd agree. Truly this is the best DDD theme, right next to Mass DDD. Never thought the latter would ever get an equal. The way the DDDs get sent flying into Ds still cracks me up to this day. So now that all five Popstar worlds are done and the Access Arc's legs are all broken, it's time for the final world of Robobot. Taking inspiration from the introduction of Triple Deluxe's final world as Kirby enters Haltman's vast mothership, every one of the levels found here are pure gold. As if representing a slow descent into madness, the first one here is about what you'd expect out of some big corporation. It's clean halls adorned with countless images of Haltman being probably the most normal in the entire Access arc. Seeing how it's definitely canon that Haltman visited Rockstar at some point to be able to recreate picks, it seems he also somehow got to Halcantra's egg engines in order to replicate the Metal General. Then in the various labs that make up the next two levels, we see the return of nearly all the mechanics introduced in the game, each one not sticking around for too long in order to keep the variety going. Which brings me to the last two stages of Access arc where things completely go off the rails. In what's still one of the most ominous final portions of a Kirby game, the end of Axis Arc sends Kirby into a strange altered reality that's practically creating itself as you move through it. It's a pretty sudden shift in setting that's vast emptiness is more than a bit off-putting. Even now as I replayed this game, those platforms that form out of nothing were so anxiety-inducing. They really did have to put that one cube right in the corner so by the time you notice it, it's already too late. And of course, this wouldn't be a modern Kirby game without the final stage serving as a victory lap for the game's main gimmick, this new version of the mini-boss rush being the absolute best, because instead of just throwing them in front of you to punch away like you'd expect, you're actively shooting them down with the Jet Robobot, which was a nice surprise. I will say, seeing the harder version of the Gigavolt fight here, it does make me wish there were more Robobot armor exclusive fights like this. Not really much of a gripe, as what they made for it was already enough, but you can't deny that it'd be cool. Now with that final level done, let's take one final look at the game up until this point, or more specifically, its music. Like I said earlier on, the more electronic instruments used in Robobot soundtrack absolutely make it what it is. The abundance of remixes found in the game actually makes sense thematically, as in my eyes, with the areas of the game all being located on Popstar, it only makes sense that altered themes would play in areas Kirby's probably already been to before the invasion. Out of all the level remixes, I'd have to say the Robobot version of Dark Castle takes the cake. I mean honestly, not only is it a fantastic remix, but I'll always be happy to see Dreamland 2 get some love. Though enough on remixes, when it comes to original tracks, there's no end in sight to the quality. If I had to pick one, that initial theme for the Desert World's first level goes way harder than I'd ever expect. That aggressive percussion is music to my ears, and the Deep Sea theme from the world before it gets an honorable mention. However, I don't want to spend too much time on the pop star themes, as I could go on and on. What I want to focus on the most are the bangers of Access Arc, more specifically the middle two themes of the world, because they're both superb. Absolutely blindsiding me from the beginning of its second stage, Jun Ishikawa takes Robobot's already electronic leaning soundtrack and pushes it straight into full E. EDM. I never knew I needed Kirby music like this, and honestly, I want more. The part of the theme that slides in some surprise dubstep makes this already great song that much more memorable. You can tell he had fun experimenting with this one. Then in the song backing the bizarre virtual reality portion of Access Arc, this level is absolutely carried by its theme. Sure, the insane background and sudden platforms do help, but nothing makes you more uneasy about this section than this song. With it starting out in pure chiptune with barely anything accompanying it, Robobot makes you keenly aware that this location is unlike any others preceding it. This is only further emphasized when the melody switches over to strings, those strings only speeding up in pace throughout the song, as if to represent the massive computational power of the Access arc generating this barren virtual landscape. It's a jarring tone shift that sets up the insanity ahead pretty well in my opinion. So with that taken care of, we're headed for the climax. 
Although before reaching this Holtman guy we've heard so much about, there's a new Mecha Knight fight to be had. This time actually sporting his theme, I'll admit it was a bit unsettling when he all of a sudden generated that disproportionate oversized arm. Glad we at least get a chance to free Meta Knight from being trapped in such an awful situation. Following that, after all this time, we finally get a chance to meet President Haltman, who at this moment already dropped some pretty significant info. I've gotta hand it to Hal, after all these years of boss crafting, they've still got it and then some with this Haltman fight going immediately insane. Absolutely topping any of its counterparts in previous games, this battle is a worthy climax for a character that's been alluded to practically all game. Even in the normal mode here, if it's your first time playing, you'll definitely be caught off guard as Haltman can be incredibly unpredictable. To achieve that, along with a solid pool of attacks to choose from, the fight technically has four different phases to it, each one changing the stage, attacks, or both in the fight. At a glance, it's nothing that crazy as half his attacks consist of him shooting or charging at you, it's the sheer rapidness at which all this happens that makes him hard to keep up with at times. In a storytelling sense, you can absolutely tell there's something off with him. And when it comes to audio, this fight doesn't only have a fantastic track, it has actual voice acting. Not voice acting in terms of speaking words, mind you, but Haltman's laughs and screams throughout the fight are genuinely upsetting in their intensity. Seeing how Hal started experimenting with actual voices more in Triple Deluxe, you can tell they got their bearings here. Especially with the attack that sends four energy beams out, that scream he does honestly blurs the line between him crying out in triumph or in pain. Knowing his juicy backstory, it's so much more unsettling. Can't forget about this fight's theme though, because to match all that, it's a crazy one. Packing in enough time signature changes to keep you from ever getting comfortable with the pace of the song, it perfectly encapsulates having to face such an insane egomaniac. As if that wasn't enough, the frequent distortion of the melody, combined with the generally bizarre instruments like that vocal sample that's used, makes everything about this song come together perfectly in one chaotic package. Seriously, going back a few Kirby games, this would already be final boss levels of quality, which when it comes to normal Kirby fights, it technically is for the main story, because from here, the upcoming fights are unlike anything we've seen until now. In the following cutscene that sees Star Dream absorbing Haltman's consciousness after Susie's betrayal, we're at what in my humble opinion is the coolest moment in the entire Kirby series. I'll fight all of you on this. As to chase after Star Dream, who's taken the company's goals a bit too literally and now plans to eliminate all organic life, the only way Kirby can stop it is to get in the robot. Only the normal Robobot armor isn't enough to chase after Star Dream. It needs way more firepower, which conveniently comes in the form of Meta Knight's ship, the Halberd. I don't care if this was your first Kirby game or you've played everyone like me, this scene that has Kirby fusing with the entire Halberd is the best. Especially if you had some good stickers on your Robobot armor. It doesn't get more hype than taking to the skies with a ship that's been shown throughout the entire series to be incredibly powerful. I can barely find enough words to praise it. Thus, changing things up from the side-scrolling shooters we've seen quite a bit now in Kirby, the final showdown with Star Dream goes full 0-2 with the gameplay transitioning to a rail shooter. In this new final boss, Star Dream throws practically everything at you with a variety of lasers, missiles, and even other robots. What's cool about this portion on top of everything is instead of this purely being a rail shooter, Hal managed to maintain one of the core Kirby mechanics within it. Because while you absolutely can beat this fight solely by shooting at it, Kirby can technically inhale things still. Or to be more specific, if you manage to destroy certain projectiles thrown at you, their debris can be absorbed by the Halberd to charge an all-out attack. For a segment that only appears at the end, it honestly makes the fight incredibly dynamic since now you've got to focus on both avoiding and getting in the line of fire also that you can absorb more debris. Not to mention, that spin move you can do saved me a lot of times. Honestly, nothing sets the stakes quite like the background to this fight showing the fates of all other mechanized planets in full display. It's pretty dark when you think about it. Rather than Popstar being the main target of every villain ever, this time it was just supposed to be another footnote in Haltman's unchecked mechanization of the known universe. So despite it throwing everything at you here, this is only the first phase of three, Star Dream screwing itself into the access arc and combining with it. If a bit ominous, this fight is pretty similar to the first phase, more advanced projectiles and attacks getting sent out. It's probably due to the sheer size of it, but that attack where it regrows its leg things was seriously threatening. Though unlike the last phase, as you do damage here, pieces of Star Dream's armor begin falling off. Which for the more astute Kirby fans might look like there's a familiar face hiding within the access arc itself. And once you enter the third phase, it becomes clear that Star Dream as a whole was just a Nova this entire time. I'll save you from the lore ramblings as there's no need for me to do it twice, but purely as a Kirby fan, I had to pause the game for a solid second just to process the implications of this reveal. This is what I love about being a Kirby fan, there's really not that many series out there that reward you this much for following the series from the beginning, especially not that many that have been going on for this long. However, at the same time, I don't ever feel like it takes away from those who play these games as their entry into the series. Like sure, this fight 
site is riddled with references, from Star Dream conjuring the original Galactic Nova's accessories to the countdown in the battle, but it's still an incredibly fun fight for the uninitiated. That charge attack is practically essential with it allowing you to deal more damage after you use it. Also, one little tidbit I realized while writing this, know how at the end of the countdown in the fight, Star Dream hits a fatal error and restarts? Well, with the knowledge that Haltman had reactivated Star Dream in order to get his daughter Susie back, the rogue wishing machine is probably still trying to grant that wish despite everything. Only as Susie made it back on her own a long time ago, it's permanently stuck in a cycle of trying to retrieve something that's long been recovered. Robobot really hits different. Though then, there's the matter of the music backing these fights, all of which are superb. This time starting out with a triumphant theme filled to the brim with light motifs, it brilliantly sets the stage for this world-ending battle, making it all the more unsettling when in the second phase, everything shifts to a pretty ominous and calm theme in comparison. In my case, it pretty accurately mirrored my anticipation at what exactly was behind the Access Arc's armor. And boy oh boy the theme of the third phase. It's been used as a motif throughout the game, but it's pretty wild how the core of the song is actually just the title theme. Go back and listen for yourself if you doubt me, it really is. Alongside it, they also sprinkled in some Heart of Nova for good measure, the beat from the theme persisting through a lot of the song as if to remind you this isn't the first time you've faced such a foe. Thus, after that final phase, Hell had to end this off properly with one final push. I love how they established this mechanic early on with Gigavolt, only to bring it back for the finale. That's some good game design. So with that melancholic end to one of the best Kirby scenarios ever created, it's time to bury our sorrows in unlockables. Assuming by this point you've gotten all the code cubes and received your consolation prize, we're still left with a good amount of content, like this game's sub-games for example. With Team Kirby Clash, the gameplay transforms into an action RPG that I'm sure plenty of you are familiar with by now. There's not much to it honestly, but I guess that's kind of influenced by the knowledge of all the content that'd be made for its successors. More importantly in my eyes, there's Kirby 3D Rumble, the sub-game that actually experimented with 3D platforming. Now that's relevant right now. I really wonder if that cancelled game was going for gameplay somewhat like this. I know the platforms in the one screenshot of it definitely look similar to these, but I don't want to spend that much time talking about those because to the joy of many, Meta Nightmare makes its third appearance in Robobot. Functioning much like it did in Superstar Ultra, with it largely being oriented around Meta Knight zooming through the game, it was interesting how they modified two of his abilities here. I'm glad they managed to bring his crew back in some capacity here, but man, I'll always miss that screen-covering tornado. And just like its last incarnation, aside from harder bosses, things are about the same until the very end, where replacing Star Dream as a final boss, you've got to fight three all-powerful opponents back to back. Laying on even more nostalgia than I expected, first Star Dream recreates the Dark Matter Swordsman from Kirby's Dreamland 2. Full disclosure, all the Dark Matter entities in Kirby have some of my favorite designs out of anything, the two phases of Dark Matter Swordsman being one of the best. And here we get the best of both worlds because they kind of combine both the phases into one fight. They're no pushover either, that laser attack from the second phase still getting me out after all these years. Next, in a far more recent reference, Star Dream revives Sectonia from the last game. Aside from her doing some of her harder attacks earlier on, she's not that different compared to her original fight here. No more dealing with her japing you by smashing that crystal at least. It's a good warm up for what's to come, because to the detriment of Star Dream, Galactonite triumphantly makes his third appearance. Where I found Return to Dreamland's Galactonite to be a bit too similar to the original to challenge me that much, they modified him just enough here to put me in a shallow grave. Not to mention, of course all these remixes sufficiently slap, but this version of Galactonite's theme is still my favorite. The injection of more electronic instruments to get the song to fit into Robobot's theming works really well. Then, like always, with that taken care of, all that's left are the arenas. In all these playthroughs, I've managed pretty well taking down true arenas with no copy ability. For my past two Kirby videos, I got both of them done in an afternoon. Well, let's just say that wasn't the case when I finally got to Robobot's true arena. I managed the earlier fights decently enough, some always taking a bit more health from me than I'd like, but good god the final four fights of this one are hell without an ability. I guess it makes sense that in a game with so many cheese abilities, doing it without one is true punishment. I know for a fact that the only way I beat it originally was through the funny arrow method, and even then it took me multiple tries. Seriously, some of these are pure evil, like Dark Matter and Sectonia getting combined into one fight. Just talking about it now is bringing the pain back. In Dark Matter's first phase, your window to get a projectile is so small, and somehow Galactonite 
fight is still worse than that. It didn't help that I could never seem to make it this far with very much health, leading to many runs getting destroyed as I kept trying to beat him without taking damage. That new attack where he gets you from the background always took me by surprise with how much of the stage it covers. Honestly, I'd say Galactonite gave me more trouble than the true arena version of Star Dream's Rail Shooter segment, though that's mostly due to it being fairly easy to avoid attacks there if you know what you're doing. Well, everywhere except for the third phase, where admittedly, it was significantly more challenging actually getting debris while also avoiding attacks. I hate that one with a burning passion. All in all, though, it still didn't take any tries for me to take down Star Dream Soul's third phase, which I guess makes sense considering this isn't even the hard part. In a twist deviating from the end of the story, Star Dream Soul has one brutal final fight within it. Fully remixing Heart of Nova and overtly referencing the fight from Superstar, there's no starship to save you now. At first in the phase where you're taking down the individual parts, it's almost as if the game is luring you into a false sense of security with how simple they are to take down, only to then destroy you in the next phase that sees the core of Star Dream attacking you itself. It's a really well-designed fight, showing that when they want to, HAL absolutely can make some truly challenging Kirby content. I feel the worst part of doing this without a copy ability is this fight becomes twice as long with how many attacks you've got to brave in order to get a projectile. I know it would have probably helped me to dodge more, I just really suck at the timing. Star Dream got me with its Soul Cutter attack more times than I'd like to admit. And when you get to the end of the fight, finally you've beaten the true arena, your naive little mind thinks. As in one final middle finger from Hal to the droves of people who incessantly complain about Kirby difficulty, the boss sends out three attacks that'll KO you no matter how much health you have. I don't care how good you are, everyone's fallen for this BS at least once. It has to be one of the most cruel things in any Kirby game. The final final attack where you've got to thread the needle between the two of them is only made harder by how tense this portion makes you. Though if you manage to overcome that, congratulations, you've beaten Kirby Planet Robobot. Now it needs to be said that without the games leading up to it, Kirby Planet Robobot would be a shell of its current self. After all, a triple deluxe waltz so that Planet Robobot could run, and most of its core features including grinding for collectibles to complete the game remaining in Robobot. I am glad they changed up the trend with 100% completion cutscenes, albeit the one here is pretty bittersweet knowing all of the lore. It may not have full multiplayer capabilities like Return to Dreamland, but just looking at the core game as a whole, I really think Robobot is the peak of modern 2D Kirby. It's like the devs of the game had been saving tons of great gameplay ideas and finally let them loose in a single game. And sure, I do acknowledge that I have a lot of bias affecting me here with the vast volume of remixes and references to previous games, but I feel even beyond that, Robobot's core gameplay is some of the best Kirby's ever had. With how much is taken from its predecessors alongside new mechanics, it makes for the perfect Kirby package. Plus, don't even get me started on the story and lore. They definitely matured a fair amount with the lore of Triple Deluxe, but I think everyone will agree that Robobot still has some of the most most heart-wrenching lore in the series. I'm still not over how you can hear Haltman's faint screams when you destroy parts of Star Dream Soul's final phase. If anything, the one downside that came with Robobot is it set an extremely high bar for subsequent games to top, which as much as I love Star Allies, I believe still hasn't been done yet. However, with Kirby and the Forgotten Land coming out later this month, I have high hopes that HAL will be able to do just that. It's definitely looking like they will, and while I'll absolutely be streaming Forgotten Land in its entirety from day one, I figured what better way to lead into that than to marathon as many Kirby games as I can daily until the game releases. I'll actually be starting that tomorrow with whichever game you all decide I should play through the Twitter poll that's up right now. Go follow me fast if you want to help decide. The stream begins tomorrow at 8pm EST, so do stop by. If you happen to miss any of these, I always upload them to my VOD channel the day after I stream. So yeah, that's Kirby Planet Robobot, the accumulation of countless games that in my opinion will continue on as a shining example of how to make a proper Kirby game. To those who've continued to help out the channel, I'd like to give a heartfelt thanks to everyone who's decided to contribute. You guys are the best. If you want to help me continue making more videos like these, and receive a special thank you amongst a lot of other bonus stuff, do check out my Patreon, a link in the description. Now I'm sure you're thinking, Monger, didn't you skip a game? And yeah, sadly, I didn't have enough time to cover Triple Deluxe. With how close Forgotten Land is, I figured it'd be best if I cover Robobot first before anything, with how much it'll affect the series going forward. Don't fret, videos on both Star allies and triple deluxe will come at some point in the future. I've got a lot to say about the both of them. By the way, if I sound any different in this video, it's because I got braces on earlier this month. Hope my lisp wasn't too bad. So that being said, I'm the RPG Monger, and don't forget that each and every one of you are fantastic.